So dear students, I welcome you to my class and I wish you a very good afternoon. Today I like to tell you something about African literature. It is a prologue, you may call it a prologue because this very prologue will help you understand African literature and it will also give you an access into Chinua Achebe. It is very essential to have a very discursive discussion or discursive portrayal of African literature just before starting Chinua Achebe's text. African literature is not new. Its history is very old. We know the history of English literature and we start from Anglo-Saxon age and we study English literature from Anglo-Saxon to this postmodern period. And we know that the Anglo-Saxon period uh, was uh, it, it started after the departure of the Romans, the Roman conquerors left Britain in 405 AD, that is after date. And after that, Anglo Saxons and Jews came to Britain from Scandinavian countries and they introduced storytelling, the art of storytelling. And from that very particular practice, English literature emanated. So if you think of English literature's origin, you must go to the art of storytelling. And if you think of our literature, Bengali literature, it also emanated from the art of storytelling. If you think of Thakur Marjuli, that is the bag of grandmother or the basket of grandmother. You will find that all the stories were at first traveling from lips to lips. But Dokkina Ranjan Mitro for the first time collected those stories from different areas of this subcontinent and he incorporated those stories into a book and he entitled the name of the book Thakur Marju. So literature it started its journey with the journey of human beings, with the journey of the community. So the history of literature is as old as the history of mankind. Very often we think of literature in written form only, but literature has got two forms. One is written and the other is oral. Oral literature is called orature. And literature that is available in written form is called literature or written literature. So if we look upon literature as only written literature, that would be a mistake. Literature has got another very potential form and that is orature. Now, come to African literature. African literature is very old, especially orature. If you examine Africa anthropologically, you will find that uh, African culture was very old. And they also had their own way of educating their people. They had their own way of educating them. The Africans used to educate their people or educate their children through storytelling. And storytellers were greatly honored in African culture. The male storyteller was called Griot, and female storyteller was called Griotes. And these Griots and Griotesses were highly honored and regarded among different tribes, ethnic groups of Africa. 
and these griots and griotesses used to tell stories. The people used to gather around them and they narrated their stories. Their stories were about their mythology. Their stories were about their ancestors, heroism, chivalric activities, performances. Their stories were also about the morality, ethical values and aesthetics of the African people. So these griots and griotesses wanted to teach the African children through storytelling. And those stories which were told by the griots and griotesses to the children were the primary sources of African literature. So if anybody asks you about the source of African literature, you have to focus on this particular point that storytelling, which was a millennium, millennium old tradition among the Africans was the source of African literature. The Africans uh, used to communicate among themselves verbally. They did not have a written form of language. They did not have alphabet. Okay, if you think of the um, primitive period, or if you think of the history of Africa uh, 1000 or, uh, or 5000 years ago, you will find that they had language, but they did not have alphabet. But ultimately, alphabet came to them through the conquest of the or through the advent of the Arabian merchants, the Tartars who came to uh, Ethiopia, Sudan, uh, and Somalia, especially in the seventh century, these Arabian merchants and traders came to these parts of Africa with their language, Arabic language. And this Arabic language uh, contributed immensely to the development of African language in written form. Then Roman language also contributed uh, to the development of African alphabet. But we must not think that Africa was an empty vessel or Africa was a blank page. It was not a blank page. It had its own language. It had its own belief system. It had its own aesthetics, but it did not have its alphabet. That was its weakness. Africans had their religion, but they did not have their religious books. They did not have any scriptures. They had gods and goddesses, but they did not uh, have any particular temples. They used to construct the statues of gods and goddesses. They worshiped them. They uh, begged help from them and cooperation from them. And if they met any natural calamities or catastrophe, then out of frustration or disappointment, they used to destroy those gods and goddesses. So the Africans constructed their own gods and goddesses. They also destroyed their gods and goddesses. Actually, that, that was the specialty of Africans and African gods and goddesses. Suppose if you go to the uh, Greeks, they had gods and goddesses. They had their temples. They used to worship their gods and goddesses in the temples, but they did never destroy the statues of their gods and goddesses. Whatever happened, whether it was uh, beneficial or not beneficial, they used to show their unadulterated submission to gods and goddesses. But the Africans uh, gave emphasis on the free will of man. Even today, if you go to Africa and if you meet the people from different uh, ethnic groups, for example, Igbo or Yoruba or Bantu people, Pygmies, Sotho, you will find that those people uh, have their religions but their gods and goddesses are not more powerful than human beings. 
So this is a specialty of African religion and African gods and goddesses. Okay. So anyway, in this way, we find that the Africans had their own culture and cultural ingredients. And while the colonizers, especially the European colonizers came to Africa, they started destroying the indigenous cultural values of the Africans. They wanted to destroy the identity, distort the identity of the Africans. So with that very deliberate mission, they imposed their own language. They imposed their own religion. They imposed their own culture upon the local people. And they went on with a promulgation uh, that they did not have any literature, they did not have any language, they did not have any culture. So if the Africans wanted to become civilized, they must show their allegiance to the Europeans. They must receive the imported cultures brought by the Europeans to Africa. That was a very deliberate mission. And they became to a great extent successful in their mission. And as a part of this mission, if you think of <clears throat> the colonial literature on it, I do not want to go to the colonial economy. I do not want to concentrate on the colonial uh, social politics or economic politics. I do not want to concentrate on their other practices. I just like to concentrate on the practice that they did through their writings, especially literature then I find that the colonial literature, that is the literature produced by the Europeans, uh, in which Africa was used as a uh, subject matter, then we find that Africa is distorted in many ways in their texts. And if you think of the heart of darkness, you will find the same Thing there. The Africans did not speak. Marlowe went to the heart of Congo. Kurtz was already there. And what did they do there? These agents of European colonization were practicing all kinds of inhuman activities. They forced the people, enslaved the people, they compelled them to collect ivory for them, and they used to export ivory to their countries and earned lots of money. So colonization was a money-making enterprise. It was not a civilizing mission. At this time, it was only a um, colonizing mission. And this colonizing mission was uh, justified by the Europeans with a slogan. The slogan was that they were colonizing the people to uh, teach them civilization. So that was their propaganda, and it was uh, uh, tinged with hypocrisy. It was fraught with hypocrisy. So anyway, if you think of the other texts, suppose uh, Joyce Carey's text, uh, Mr. Johnson. Mr. Johnson is a text written by uh, Joyce Carey in 19. 39, Mr. Johnson. And if you read this novel, you will find an Isarian character. His name is Mr. Johnson. He is educated, but he is not fit for any bureaucratic job. He is not fit for the job that the Europeans enjoy. He is fit for only the clerical job. So he does the job of a clerk in an office. And ultimately, we find that this Mr. Johnson is involved in forgery, in crafts, in theft, in killing also. So he is uh, depicted with all his dark aspects. So why? Because he is an African, because he's a Nigerian, and in the eyes of the Europeans, the Nigerians or the Africans do not have civilization. If they are educated, yes, they may be educated, but their education uh, cannot make them fit for a 
bureaucratic job or for the job equal to that of the Europeans. They are fit for the clerical job only. They are clownish. They may be suited with a gentleman, but they are clownish. They are never equal to the Europeans. So this prejudice of the European writers is reflected in European texts about Africa. And uh, Chinua Achebe, now come to Chinua Achebe. While Chinua Achebe was a student of high school, then he was greatly surprised. He was greatly surprised as, at the discovery of this hypocritical picture of the hypocritical picture uh, portrayed by the European writers. He was greatly shocked. He read Heart of Darkness in his school, and he was greatly shocked at the deliberate politics of the European writers. While he was a child, and he did not, or he could not develop critical attitude to the European text, he was impressed by the portrayal, he was impressed. And very often he took the side of the uh, white people. Suppose in Heart of Darkness, we find two parties. One is Africa, African party, and the other is the European party. The African party is depicted with all their crudeness, all its crudeness, all its ignorance, all its uh, savagery. The Africans are depicted there as animals. The chains uh, are at their uh, throat and uh, they are speechless. They do not speak. They are treated like animals. They are engaged in different risky activities. They are not doing the jobs that the Europeans used to do. They are doing the jobs which are not fit for or which are not done by the Europeans. So they are treated as a painstaking animals or, or uh, the beast of burden. Okay. That was the attitude or that was the picture of the Africans in the texts of the Europeans. And Achebe said, uh, in a writing that while he was a child and he did not develop critical uh, faculty, he used to take the side of the white people. And he also used to uh, possess a negative attitude towards the Africans. So just think of it, how the colonial texts construct a colonial mind. That is, if you read the colonial text uncritically, Suppose you are reading a passage to India, which depicts the picture of Dr. Rajis. And if you do not read this text critically, then you may take the side of Pilling, or you may take the side of Ronnie Hislop, or you may take the side of Mrs. Moore, or you may uh, look upon Dr. Rajis as a clumsy, lousy fellow. But if you are a critical reader, you will question E.M. Forster, why he has produced this dichotomy or these nuances in his portrayal of the uh, Anglo-Indian characters and the Indian characters, why he had incorporated these nuances into this text. He had done all these things deliberately to show that the British are superior to the Indians. And he had another deliberate intention. If the Europeans are superior to the people of this subcontinent, then what should we do? We have to take up the Europeans as our masters. And we have to show subjugation, unadulterated subjugation to the British or uh, the colon colonial uh, people here, or colonizing people here, that we have to look upon them to be our masters and we are slaves to them. 
That was the politics done by literature, colonial literature. And Chinua Achebe at first could not identify it while he was a child. But while he could develop his critical faculty, he could understand how deliberately that very politics was practiced by the European writers in their literary text. Then in response to this colonial discourse, in response to the Eurocentric discourse, Chinua Achebe wrote Things All Apart. So Things Fall Apart was not an accidental text, or you cannot call it uh, uh, an ingredient of pleasure literature. Pleasure literature, you know, Anundo Shahitto. Chinua Achebe is not producing pleasure literature or Anundo Shahitto. His literary creation is very serious. So what does he uh, mean to say while he uh, writes things fall apart or why does he write things fall apart he writes things fall apart in 1958 as a response to the colonial discourse the colonial discourse which was distorting african identity which was going on with the propaganda that the africans did not have their culture that africa was a blank sheet of paper, there was nothing written on it, and the Europeans wrote everything on it. That very propaganda was challenged by Chinua Achebe. And if you read Things Fall Apart, you will find Chinua Achebe has depicted almost all the major rituals of African culture. What do the Africans do during harvesting time? What do the Africans do during the what time? What do the Africans do during their marriage or marital festival or matrimonial festival? And what do the Africans do when their uh, honored elderly people die? or what do they do during the funeral of the Africans. And Chinua Achebe has also depicted what the Africans do during the uh, critical period or critical situation of familial life or social life of the Africans. And through the portrayal of all these things, through the portrayal of all these things, Chinua Achebe has said in Things Fall Apart that the Africans have a complete code of life. They need not borrow anything, any ingredient of life from the Europeans. The Africans have their own religion. They have their own stories. They have their own mythologies. They have their own belief system. They have their own government system. So why should they borrow all these things from the Europeans? The Europeans rather go on with the propaganda that the Africans do not have all these things. They do not have their language, so they should borrow the language of the Europeans. They do not have their religion, so they should borrow the religion of the Europeans, that is Christianity. You know that Christianity was a religion of the colonizers and it was a colonial tool. Christianity was not a matter of spirituality to the colonizers. Remember this, you must not forget it. Christianity was not a matter of spirituality or it was not practiced for spiritual salvation. It was used as a tool or as a weapon to control the people or to bring about changes in the psychology of the natives. And the natives remain busy with Christianity. And by this time, the Europeans used to maximize their capital. Suppose in this subcontinent, if you think of Indian subcontinent, why did they uh, spread Christianity here? 
though they could not become very, very successful, as successful they were in Africa, because in this subcontinent, we had some well-established uh, religions. For example, Hinduism is a very old religion here, and it is well-established religion. Islam is also a well-established well religion here. And both these religions have their own religious institutions, religious leaders, religious books also. We have Quran, the Hindus have their Vedas or, or other scriptures. Then the Buddhists have their Tripita. So uh, the Christianity, especially the Christianity imported by the Europeans could not find a very, very congenial atmosphere in this subcontinent as it found in Africa because the Africans were segregated. Even today, if you go to Africa, or if you read the history of Africa, you will find that the Africans are divided into different ethnic groups. And each ethnic group has its own religion, its own pantheon, that is gods and goddesses. They have their own government system. One group or one ethnic group does not follow the religion of the other ethnic group. And very often, one ethnic group is set against another ethnic group and they uh, involve themselves in corrosive battle. So why? Because of the nuances, because of the differences of these ingredients of their life. And that was an advantage for the colonizers. They very subtly infused Christianity in those pitfalls of the Africans. And the Africans received Christianity. In this subcontinent, I just wanted to draw your attention to the condition of Christianity in this subcontinent. In this subcontinent, Christianity is spread uh, to some extent. Why? Because the Europeans uh, studied the case of diseases in our country, in our subcontinent. We had cholera, we had also diarrhea, we had uh, tuberculosis. So the Europeans uh, went on with the propaganda that the religion or religious institutions, for example, the temples of the Hindus, and they referred to the temples of Puri, that those places were very unhygienic. And those places were uh, the center of the germs of all these diseases, suppose cholera, uh, diarrhea, or chicken pox, et cetera, et cetera. So these religions are unhygienic. On the other hand, Christianity is a hygienic religion. So take up Christianity and save yourselves from the germs of these uh, epidemic diseases, for example, cholera, diarrhea, tuberculosis, or malaria. Okay, so just think of the politics of the Europeans. They used our epistemology and misrepresented it to us and imposed their own epistemology upon the people here. And they did this very thing very uh, fatally and cruelly in Africa. And it was easy for them to do in Africa because the Africans were divided. They did not have a singular religion or they did not have a major religion. For that reason, it was very much uh, easy for the Europeans to uh, impose their Christianity upon the people. Okay, and Chinua Achebe very powerfully observed it. But one thing that you must not forget that Chinua Achebe's father was a Christian. His mother was a Christian. His family was a Christian family. But many of his relatives, many of his kids and kids were not Christians. They were pagans. And Achebe's advantage was that on Sundays, he used to go to the church with his father and he participated in the congregation in the church. And at the same time, on other days of the week, he used to go to the 
uh, statues of different gods and goddesses, pagan gods and goddesses worshipped by his uh, other relatives. So we find that Achebe lived on a cross-cultural platform, cross-cultural platform. So that very uh, particular uh, thing or uh, aspect of Achebe's life helped him a lot to develop an accommodative worldview. So Achebe was a Christian, but he was not an Orthodox Christian. He was Christian and equally he was pagan. And he could bring about a kind of compromise, a kind of amalgamation between these two different religious ideologies. For that reason, Achebe was different from many of the African writers. He was not a narrow-minded or chauvinistic African. He believed in accommodation. Achebe believed that Africa had a very rich culture, cultural heritage. But the Europe, Europeans had also their own cultural heritage. So there may be a kind of synthesis between these two different civilizations, two different cultures, two different ideologies. And if this synthesis may be done on the basis of consent, on the basis of mutual understanding, then there would be a hybridized culture. There would be a kind of hybridization. Hybridization does never mean annihilation. Hybridization enriches each other. Suppose we are now celebrating Pahila Vaisha, and at the same time, we are celebrating Valentine's Day. We are celebrating 31st. So this is called synthesis. We are celebrating 31st, but we are not banishing or we are not uh, giving up our Pahila Vaisha. So we are celebrating both the festivals side by side. This is called uh, the accommodative disposition. So in the state of globality or in the uh, time of global uh, reality, we cannot keep ourselves aloof or away from the uh, from this hybridization. We cannot keep ourselves aloof from this hybridization or from this admixture of different cultures. This is the place where Achebe stands, and from that very place he has written, things fall apart. So things fall apart is a picture of African society, and at the same time it presents a very broad worldview of Chinua Achebe. So now I like to go into this text and make you acquainted with different aspects of this text in detail. <clears throat> so just look at the screen. This is lecture highlights. Critical analysis of things fall 